Right, where do we stand with the gig economy? Ever since the market bottomed in October of 2022, the likes of Uber, Lyft, and DoorDash have been on fire. And the newly public Maple Bear, that's the parent of Instacart, finally started roaring this January. But then the market cooled on growth stocks in March and April, and these gig economy names pulled back from their highs. Pulled back dramatically, actually. All of a sudden, these companies had a lot to prove with their first quarter reports. And now that we've heard from them, I want to give you an update on the gig economy, starting with the rideshare plays and then going over to the delivery services after the break. Keep in mind, until a few years ago, none of these companies had really had to care about profitability. It wasn't in the cars. whole industry was propped up by endless venture capital money. Endless because the Fed kept interest rates so low for so long that it was insanely cheap for these companies to borrow money. That all changed when the Fed started tightening in 2022, and the gig economy plays had to pivot to profitability. As a result, all of these services became a lot more expensive. So how are they handling the new world? Why don't we start with Uber Technologies, the number one player in ride sharing with 76% market share and a heavy hitter in the meal delivery space, 23% market share, way behind DoorDash, though, but much higher than anybody else. Under the leadership of CEO Derek Hospitari, Uber's stock rallied from $20 at its lows to a couple of years ago to above 80 at its highs in March before pulling back to $66 today. The stock could soar like that because these guys figured out how to deliver profitable growth. When Uber reported in February, they delivered blowout numbers and followed that up a few days later by announcing a $7 billion buyback. Wow. First in its, in its company's history. Then growth stocks went out of style, as I mentioned, in March and April. The stock gave up a decent chunk of its gains, and everybody started worrying about the fundamentals. But the fundamentals, they turned out to be fine. When Uber reported last Wednesday, I thought the results were mostly pretty good. Revenue beat, EBITDA beat, massive free cash flow beat, with the latter up 148% year for year. There were some issues, though. Starting with the fact that Uber's gross bookings missed, thanks to a shortfall in the ride-sharing business. Ooh, bread and butter. Plus, on the earnings front, well, they lost 32 cents. That was a surprise loss. Wall Street was looking for 22 cent profit. Now, I don't blame them, though. CEO Dario Costasari explained that the loss came primarily from a markdown for Uber's equity stakes in other companies. Like the ride-sharing company in China, they had DD Global. It had nothing to do with the core business, so it should have been ignored. Management's guidance for the current quarter was technically mixed, though. But it certainly didn't help. Bad gross bookings, forecasts, inline EBITDA forecasts. That was not good. I think it was this softness in the gross bookings that sent the stock down 5.7% last Wednesday because it seemed to confirm the consumer weakness fears that, we've been, that they've all been festering on Wall Street. You hear about that all the time, right? How weak the consumer's gotten. On top of that, maybe people wanted to hear more about what Uber's got for autonomous driving. Given all the noise Tesla's been making about its robo-taxis, but Custer Sari basically said autonomous vehicles aren't happening anytime soon. Wow. Overall, though, i got to tell you, even after that, I'm pretty sanguine about the prospects of Uber. The bull thesis here is that the company's consistently growing profits and throwing off tons of new cash flow, even if there's some softness on the gross bookies front. In the end, I'm viewing this post-first quarter shakeout as an appropriate reset of expectations. Plus, even after Uber's pulled back to the 60s, the stock remains up more than 7% year-to-date. And hey, this sell-off also gives management a chance to put that big buyback to work. you got my blessing to buy it, because the company will be buying along, right alongside you. I really like the stock here. As for Lyft, L-Y-F-T, the underdog in ride-sharing space, well, you know what? They had another solid quarter. Under newest CEO David Risher, when they reported last Tuesday night, the night before we heard from Uber, and you remember David, he's been on the show a bunch of times. In fact, Uber's gross bookings miss loom so large precisely because Lyft's gross bookings beat expectations. Looks like they're finally on a more competitive footing. Lyft's gross bookings growth matched Uber's in the first quarter, and Lyft's guidance for second quarter bookings implies they'll match Uber yet again. In the old days, Lyft seemed to be steadily losing share to Uber. It now basically seems to be holding steady, which is an extremely positive development. And the good news is that they're defending their market share without compromising profitability. Lyft reported a modest EBITDA beat and surprisingly positive free cash flow for the second quarter in a row. Good guidance on the profitability front for the current quarter, too. How are they doing it? Richard credited solid execution and innovation on the platform for the much-improved numbers. I like it. I think he's right. I know, so I accept that as the main reason. As for its full-year forecast, Lyft mostly confirmed its previous outlook, except they raised their free cash flow guidance pretty substantially. That's exactly what you want to see. But the takeaway is that Lyft continued to make progress towards the goal of becoming a profitable growth story, which is what Richard's been aiming for since he took the reins about a year ago. The results were, uh, were good enough to send the stock up 7.1% last Wednesday, though Lyft has given back some of that gain since then. I have been really impressed with what Richard's done in his first year of the job, and the stock definitely deserved to rally in response to the strong quarter, especially since it looks like Lyft has stemmed the share loss to Uber and done so without compromising profitability. I bet the stock can work higher as long as those narratives remain in place. In fact, as long as Richard continues to turn things around, I actually wouldn't be surprised.
if Lyft even became a takeover target, if the stock stays down here while the big turn comes. After all, it's the smallest of the major gig economy stocks with a sub-$7 billion market cap. So the bottom line for the two major ride-sharing companies is that both reported solid quarters, even if Lyft's was well-received while Uber's was hated. Going forward, we, we have to keep an eye on whether Uber has an unaffordability problem. But for now, I'm not going to give up on this one just because of some gross bookie softness. Not when they're delivering so well on the profitability and free cash flow front. Lyft's more of a turnaround story, but turnaround's going great. And if you want to know about the delivery side of the gig economy, why don't you stick around after the break because we can tell you all about it. Mad Money's back. Coming up, Kramer continues his look at the gig economy, where to invest in the new age of work, next. Don't miss a second of Mad Money. Follow at Jim Kramer on X. Have a question? Tweet Kramer. Hashtag Mad Mentions. Send Jim an email to madmoney at cnbc.com or give us a call at 1-800-743-CNBC. Miss something? Head to madmoney.cnbc.com.